men and women of the military and the community that have passed, I would like to pledge allegiance to the flag, which is the last thing a civilian gets to do as a civilian before they enter the military. Once they say amen to that, that prayer there, you're in, baby. So in honor to people like Jack Isler, Crocker family, Lottenschlager, who all gave, and there was many that I didn't remember the name, and, and I don't have a list with me, and uh, we honor them today. I pledge allegiance. Thank you, Don. Thank you, Violet. Beloved sisters, brothers, members, guests, and friends, welcome to Richville United Church of Christ. Today we celebrate Trinity Sunday. It's the second Sunday uh, of the Pentecost Sunday, uh, Pentecost season, rather. And uh, on Trinity Sunday, we'll talk more about it later in service, but we remember the triune nature of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Uh, today is also uh, the annual Strengthening the Church Special Mission Offering. You can read about that for yourselves in the Messenger, but uh, it goes to growing uh, our denomination. Um, in fact, uh, the church I served in, in Toledo benefited from those funds um, when I was pastoring there. Uh, in addition to those celebrations, of course, we have a remembrance of Memorial Day weekend. We'll have uh, a litany in that regard uh, and just a little bit here in service. I do want to point out that our communion table flowers were given today uh, by Karen Gerber in uh, honor uh, of the memory and birthday of her father, Ron Lechner. And following worship, Bill and Gail McGrady are hosting our fellowship hour. If you do take a moment and look at the messenger, uh, I will highlight for you um, that... Uh, of course, tomorrow is Memorial Day out in society. Uh, Jenny's not in the office on Mondays anyway. Um, Wednesday, the newsletter will be printed. And of course, at 6 p.m., we'll have Bible study continuing our exploration of the book of Exodus. Uh, next Sunday will be the monthly celebration of the Lord's Supper. And uh, after fellowship hour, we will be having an outreach meeting uh, to discuss some policies and procedures around our food service ministries. Uh, as we think about Memorial Day weekend, I do want to share just a couple of facts. Many of you will be aware of these. Some of you might not be. But uh, Memorial Day originated in 1865 when freed uh, slaves who were Union soldiers uh, went out and decided to have a celebration uh, for those soldiers whose uh, burial sites had been lost. Uh, and that was in Charlton, South Carolina. Uh, they wanted to remember those uh, who had not received their proper honor, freed slaves in 1865. Then in 1868, General John A. Logan uh, proposed Memorial Day uh, or Decoration Day as a standing holiday. It was later first adopted at the statewide level in New York in 1873. And then it wasn't until 1971 uh, that the United States Congress enacted uh, the uh, Monday Memorial Day holiday for the entire country. So it's been a process to bring us to the celebrations that we have now. Uh, be that all as it may, uh, we want to move into our time of Christian worship and remember that it is through the love of God in Christ Jesus that we find ourselves gathered together this morning. Let's enjoy the gift of our prelude.
Lovely. Thank you, Jeff. Dear friends, welcome once more to Richville United Church of Christ and this Trinity Sunday when we honor Memorial Day weekend in our nation and we lift up uh, the ministry of strengthening the church at a broader level. As we move into Christ's embrace, let us do so rising in body and spirit to the best of our ability and welcome our almighty King through song. You'll join me in our call to worship and prayer of confession, which is inspired by Isaiah 6, 1 through 8. Dearest Lord, we acknowledge you on your throne high above us, high above everything. You are attended by heavenly beings, angels who testify to your holiness. May your glory be made known and the power of your presence fill this place. Forgive us. You are our king and the Lord over all, including the angels. So help us to accept the ways you want to cleanse and purify us. Prepare us to be forgiven of our sins and equipped to share your message. For we hear you asking who will respond to your call. And, and we, we want, want to respond. respond. Here, Here we are. are. Send us. us. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. As we mentioned at the beginning of service, uh, we are going to take some time and in the context of our spiritual lives as well as uh, our national identity, we're going to lift up uh, Memorial Day weekend. And so if you'll turn your attention to one of our inserts and you will see our litany for the day. I'll be the pastor and you'll be the people. In the Gospel of John, we hear the story of how Jesus, in the final hours before his death, taught his followers some essential truths. This is part of what he taught them. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. No one has greater love than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. We remember and we pray for our soldiers who laid down their lives for their friends and fellow citizens. We remember and we pray for those who did not lay down their lives but who suffered physical, emotional, or mental damage and need healing. We 
We remember and we pray for our leaders to honor our soldiers and all of us by leading with wisdom and restraint. And as we are mindful of those who have given their lives, as we think about the world we want to see and how we can do our part to bring it about, we lift up before you, holy maker of us all, those veterans from our church family who serve this nation and have returned to you. At this time, we will hear the names of members of our own congregation who have gone home to God following their military service. When I'm concluded reading this list, we'll take a moment of silence, and any of you who have a beloved deceased military service person, you are welcome to lift up their name as the Spirit leads. Lester Wilson, Don Burnham, John Calliker, Don Hunston, John Wyckoff, Ed Sunheimer, Clyde Bud Hill, Greg Bookman, Charles Barkheimer, Clyde Risher, Claude Click, Jack Isler, Larry Meyer, Don Rieger, Floyd Showalter Sr., Ted Provost, Morris C. Birch, Joe Tomkala, Sam Fry, Art Lautenschlager, Don Foster, Russell Dressler, Robert Earl, Frank Green, James Foltz, Ivan Carter, Bill Charton, Denny Mowry, Sam Collinchuk, Fletch Hunter, Ralph Smith, Ken Charton, Bill Jacobs, Bill Hillier, Bill Mattern, Bob Kintner, Jerry Joseph Miller, Pete Zizelchek Sr., Paul Kilper, James DeArman, Harry Johnson, Richard Krebs, Glenn Tipton, and Wilson Hawk. Benjamin E. Taft, Albert Rhodes, let us pray once more. Creator, Redeemer, and Sustainer of us all, we long for and pray for a world filled with peace we no longer need to lay down our lives for our friends anymore. On this Sunday before Memorial Day, we pray all of this in the name of the Prince of Peace, Jesus the Christ. Amen.
Amen. Thank you, friends. Let us turn now to the center of our worship, which as always is the reading and hearing of God's holy word. I'll be reading today from John 3, 1 through 17 out of the New International Version. Now there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the signs you are doing if God were not with him. Jesus replied, very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. How can someone be born when they are old, Nicodemus asked. Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. Jesus answered, very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the spirit. How can this be, Nicodemus asked. You are Israel's teacher, said Jesus, and you do not understand these things? Very truly I tell you, we speak of what we know, and we testify to what we have seen. But still, you people do not accept our testimony. I have spoken to you of earthly things, and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Thank you, Deb. Those are the familiar words of the good news according to John's gospel and we pray as always that the Lord would bless our reading, our hearing, our understanding and most importantly our application of this and all of Holy Scripture. But before we get into today's conversation on this week's texts, we do want to take a few moments and share God's love and truth with our youngest friends. So with that I'll say this is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. I am a child of the Most High God, wonderfully and fearfully made. Hallelujah. Every day is a gift from God, and every one of you is a gift from God. Did you start out as a gift from God? Yeah. From the moment you were conceived, you were a gift from God. Do you always behave like a gift from God? Hmm, that's a different question. Okay, well, hold that question in the back of your head and try to remember the passage that Miss Debbie read for us. Um, this is going to be difficult being a little bit further back, but uh, I've got some pictures I want to share with you guys and then some, some questions I want to ask as well. So for the folks who can't see, can anybody tell me what's in this picture? Do you recognize these people? Okay, there, there's me, and it must be Charles. Interesting. Okay, so it's a picture of me and a picture of my son, Charles. You guys can actually pass it around if you want, whatever. Now, for those of you who can see it up close, do I look like the guy in that photo? Boy look like the kid sitting in the back corner of the sanctuary right now. All right, let's keep moving on. Um, you know what, let's go back in time. Do you know who this might be? Yeah, this is me far, far away, long, long time ago. This is Will Stewart at his wrestling prime in high school. Do you recognize that guy? Am I still the same guy as in that picture? Uh, all right, let's, let's jump forward a little bit. This was the following year. 
This is going to be fun when you all actually get to see these up close. Am I the same guy in that picture as in the wrestling picture as in the picture of my son and myself? All right, how about, um, how about this one? Do you know who that is? That's me as well, with hair about to here. And this one is similar, about a year later, maybe. Same guy in all of those pictures. My son is only in one of those pictures, and I did get his permission to use that picture, by the way. Now, in the picture of Charles and myself, he was about two and a half in that photo. He is very much not two and a half now. He was sitting on my lap with a devilish little grin, an itty bitty little guy. He still sometimes has the devilish grin, but he's not that itty bitty guy. Have you seen him stand next to me recently? Why do I share all these photos and bring all this up? Well, first of all, I didn't want to rat anybody else out and show their baby pictures. He might have gotten upset with me about that, so I had to use my family. But second of all, in the story Miss Debbie read, there's a guy named Nicodemus who talks to Jesus. And Jesus says, if you want to enter the kingdom of heaven, you must be born again. So what does that mean for our kiddos? Well, every day we continue to grow and change. From the day we were conceived, we were a gift from God. But don't we want to be more of a gift from God tomorrow than we are today? Do we want to stay stuck where we are? Or do we want to change as the Spirit of God leads us, gives us new information? We carry who we have been with us all throughout our lives. Our kids are still the kids they were when they went to preschool, but now they have other layers on top of that. They're growing into adulthood, some of them faster than others. What I want our children to remember is that in Christ, we can be a new creation every day. The person you were yesterday is not the person you have to be tomorrow but you don't give up on the things that make you God's special child either. All right, I'm going to take a moment and pray for our children. And if anybody does want to take advantage of uh, Sunday school, uh, Miss Jennifer is prepared uh, to do that today. Let's talk to the Lord. God, our maker and minder, who we refer to as Father so very often, on this Trinity Sunday, we ask that we would see more and more of your nature, who you are, and that you would unveil, that you would pull back the layers and show more and more of who you built us to be in the first place. Help us to continue to grow and change into stronger, smarter, kinder, more caring people, even as we hold on to who we really are at our core. Bless our children as they continue to learn and grow and be with our Christian educator by the power of your Holy Spirit. We lift all of this up through the name, the power, and authority of your Son, your Holy Child, our precious brother, Savior, and Lord, Jesus the Christ. And may all God's children say, Amen. There we go. If any of the kids do want Sunday school, we have that available for you. Okay. Pardon me in just a moment. And as I get situated, I'd ask that you all would ready your hearts and minds to join me in another moment of prayerful preparation so we can dive into the message proper and the scriptures for this week. Holy, holy, holy. Holy are you, O Lord God Almighty. And we ask that we might fill the whole earth with your glory. Teach us the ways you would have us walk. 
Give us the words to speak that represent you wisely and well. Remove the impurities from within us. Open our hearts, our minds, our eyes, our hands, the whole of who we are to embrace your eternal truth. And as I ask these things, God, I would also pray, as always, that the words of my mouth and the thoughts and meditations of each of our hearts and minds might be acceptable in your sight, for we pray it through our rock and redeemer, the living, the resurrected and resurrecting word, Jesus the Christ. And may all God's people say, Amen. There is a common expression that I have never found who it is ascribed to specifically, but one that I'm very fond of. It says, Jesus meets us where we are, but doesn't leave us as we've been. Jesus meets us where we are, but doesn't leave us as we've been. And I think that that is illustrated in power in the gospel lesson that Debbie read for us today when Christ encountered Nicodemus. That's going to be the major thrust of our message time together. That being said, as is often the case, particularly having three readings a week, there is no way that I can give justice to today's material in just a Sunday morning sermon. I could preach this message and explore these scriptures for weeks on end, but hopefully we can at least consolidate the essentials. Jesus meets us where we are, but doesn't leave us as we've been. Or you might like to say, if we're not growing and changing, we're dying. These may seem like difficult ideas to wrestle with as people who believe that God is unchanging and supreme and that there is objective truth in the universe. However, I want to suggest that the problem is not with these notions, but our limited appreciation for the narrative history of the Bible. What do I mean by that? Here I'm going to introduce the concept of progressive revelation. For those of you who've had the misfortune of being in Bible study with me for any period of time, you've heard me talk about progressive revelation. Progressive revelation is the idea that because God is so vast and beyond our human comprehension, there was no way at any point in history that humanity could conceive of the fullness of God as individuals or even as societies. So little by little, God has shown more of who God is and what God is about to the human family. It's akin to the way that we learn how to read. Do you teach a child how to read by dropping war and peace in front of them? No. You begin with the alphabet and with phonics. And then off of those building blocks, you teach them simple words. Once they've mastered simple words, then they can move on to comprehend compound words. From compound words, they can begin to understand sentence structure. After that, you move into paragraphs. Eventually, they're reading chapter books. But it's a process that is similar to progressive revelation. God says, I am. And then little by little, throughout Judeo-Christian history and the world's civilizations, God has revealed more and more of who God is to those who are striving to be in right relationship with their maker. Let's return to John 3. As I noted, it begins with Nicodemus coming to Jesus in the dark of night. What's that all about? Nicodemus was a Pharisee. He was among the religious elite scholars but he had spiritual longings and hunger. If he acknowledged Jesus as a viable rabbi, he might incur the ire, the wrath of his fellow Pharisees. But something still compelled him to seek out this rabble rouser from Nazareth. It begins with Nicodemus seeking out Jesus 
and it ends not with verse 16, which is world famous, even for non-believers. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whomsoever shall believe in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. That's not where this section ends. It actually ends in verse 17. What does verse 17 say? Verse 17 says, For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Both verse 16 and most certainly verse 17 were revolutionary statements in Jesus' day and age. And if we take them seriously, they continue to be for us today. Too often, we revert to an ancient, a primeval mindset that God is constantly hovering the divine finger over the smite button. But here, Jesus, the full revelation of God made flesh, says what about God's desires? For God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn it, but through him it might be saved as opposed to some of the earlier understandings of God's character and nature that our Hebrew forebearers had. They saw God as the God of their mountain, the God of their geographical region, the God of their ethnicity. And consequently, their images of God were full of wrath being poured out on their neighboring nations or those who had done them dirty. That was just the beginning, but certainly not the end of the story of God being revealed to the human family. And listen, we all are subject to these narrow understandings of our world and most certainly of the divine. It comes down to the tendency towards confirmation bias rather than take on new, deeper, more nuanced information. As human beings, we have a tendency to surround ourselves with those who prop up what we already believe, who support our a priori assumptions, who let us live in our information silos. But is that what Jesus told Nicodemus would allow him to move into the kingdom of heaven? No, he said you must be born again. Or, as noted in today's message title, know better, do better. What do we do when we are confronted with a fuller and fuller understanding of the depth and breadth of the scriptures? What do we do when we have to process new information through the lens of an ever-strengthening, ever-growing Christian faith. Consider how many noble service people, in good conscience at the time, have sacrificed their good health, their psychological well-being, their very lives for military conflicts, which, in retrospect, have been roundly deemed as unwise, unfounded, if not outright immoral? Can we honor the intention and the service of the people we celebrate on Memorial Day weekend while also recognizing that our leaders nationally, internationally, have given billions of God's children over to the grave for unwarranted reasons at times? Progressive revelation the way we look at some of our conflicts today is not the way we did at the time that they were initiated. So getting away from social commentary, sticking to scripture, on this Sunday of the church year, on Trinity Sunday, we need to be mindful that while all three persons of the Godhead are expressly mentioned throughout scripture, Nowhere in the Bible is the doctrine of the Trinity explicitly stated. 
nor is belief in it one of the prerequisites for salvation. The concept, the doctrine of the Trinity did not arise until well into the first couple of centuries of the early church. Does the Bible talk about God as Father? Yes. Does the Bible refer to Jesus as the Son of God? Yes. Does the Bible talk about the Holy Spirit, even all the way back in the beginnings of the Torah? Absolutely. Do you ever once read the word Trinity in the entirety of the Judeo-Christian canon? Not once. But as we got a deeper and deeper, a fuller and fuller revelation of who God is, as we saw more and more of God's character and nature manifested through creation, through the person of Jesus, and through the work of the Holy Spirit, that idea came into starker and starker relief, fuller and fuller comprehension on our part. As Pentecostal and charismatic preacher and evangelist, founder of the God Chasers movement, Tommy Tenney wrote, the difference between the truth of God and revelation is very simple. Truth is where God has been. Revelation is where God is. Truth is God's tracks, his trail, his path. But it leads to what? It leads to him. Perhaps the masses of people are happy to know where God has been, but true God chasers are not content to just study God's trail, his truths, they want to know him. They want to know where he is and what he's doing right now. If you're the Christian today that you were the day you first believed, are you following the teachings of Jesus himself? Who said, if you want to enter the kingdom of heaven, you must be able to be born again. And the English is not very helpful. The English makes it sound like a one-and-done profession of faith. If you read it in the Greek, it's an active verb. Are you, or excuse me, adjective. Are you born again a bull? If you know better, are you capable of doing better? Stagnation will destroy spirituality. We see it elsewhere when St. Paul in 1 Corinthians 13 wrote, for now we only know in part, and we prophesy only in part. But when the complete comes, the partial will come to an end. Here I want you to think about the photos that I shared with the kids. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. But when I became an adult, I put an end to childish ways. For now, we see only a reflection, as in a mirror poorly. But then we will see face to face. Now I know only in part. Then I will know fully, even as I have always been fully known. And now faith, hope, and love remain. These three, and the greatest of them, is love. Was love the basis of Moses' commandment? at first glance. Let's think about how Jesus said that he came not to abolish one jot or tittle, one dot of the I or cross of the T of all of the law or prophets, but rather he came to fulfill them. And in his most famous sermon in Matthew 5, the Sermon on the Mount, the core teachings of our Lord and Savior, he said, you have heard it in the past an eye for an eye, and a tooth for a tooth. But I tell you. You have heard it in the past. Love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you. Christ is constantly expanding our understanding of how to be in right relationship with God and the rest of God's good creation. Here I want to briefly jump to the other passages for the week. Isaiah 6. There, early on in the prophet's call, he has this visionary experience of being led to proclaim God's message. 
And he says, I am a man of unclean lips from a land and a people of uncleanness. But he was purified through his desire to know better and then in turn do better. Here I am, Lord. And then God is able to take that fiery coal and burn away what is corrupt within us, is able to strengthen us and allow us to be better tomorrow than we are today, to know better and do better. Now that phrase, know better and do better, has been ascribed to many people throughout the decades and even the centuries. But recently, the most consistently one attributed uh, to is the poet Maya Angelou, and she knew a little bit something about that. If you don't know about Maya Angelou's biography, she started out as a lady engaged in the oldest profession, and then went on to become a professor of literature and a poet laureate known the world over for activism, for fighting for rights for all of God's children, for being a wise moral center. It expresses the phrase that she used, if you know better, do better. It expresses the grace and charity of God's heart, while also acknowledging the need for humility and transformation once we realize where and how we've been in error, like the prophet Isaiah. Or in today's passage, which actually comes to us out of Romans 8, that's a typo uh, in today's bulletin, our final passage for the week comes from Romans 8. And there, Romans 8, the author says that we should get rid of fear and that we should consider ourselves readopted into the inheritance the Lord has in store. Put away the former ignorant ways. Embrace our creator, redeemer, and sustainer and what God has been revealing to us bit by bit across the ages in our personal lives, and in our society. Therefore, brothers, we have an obligation, but it's not to the sinful nature to live according to it. For if you live according to the sinful nature, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. You'll be born again. You'll know better, and consequently, you'll do better. Because those who are led by the Spirit of God are, are children of God. For you did not make, receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear, but you received the spirit of sonship. And by that we cry, Abba, Daddy, Father. And the Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. And if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his sufferings, in order that we may also share in his glory. No better, do better. Be born again a bull. Continue to expand your understanding and appreciation of scripture and theology like Nicodemus did. Nicodemus seems like the lukewarm person that Jesus warns about elsewhere in the New Testament. He's talking out of both sides of his mouth. I think you're wonderful, Jesus, but don't let anybody know that I came to meet you. That's where he starts out. But later, in chapter 7 of the Gospel of John, he would go on to advocate for the fair treatment of Jesus when Christ was brought before the Pharisees. And finally, in chapter 19, when Jesus has been executed unjustly, Nicodemus is there with Joseph of Arimathea to honor Christ and prepare his body for burial. The man he was at the beginning of the story is not the man he became at the end. Ralph Waldo Emerson had two remarkable quotes along these lines. He said, the highest revelation is that God is in every man. And the revelation of thought takes men out of servitude into freedom. You are no longer slaves, but co-heirs with Christ, if you know better and begin to do better. Here I'm going to conclude today's message 
by sharing two very famous prayers that I think illustrate how the Holy Spirit of God, the full revelation of our Creator, can be at work in an individual believer, and then how that can have an impact on the rest of the world. Stop me if you've heard this. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. It's the serenity prayer famously ascribed to pastor and theologian Reinhold Niebuhr. Going on, it says, living one day at a time, enjoying one moment at a time, accepting hardship as a pathway to peace, Taking, as Jesus did, the sinful world as it is, not as I would have it. Trusting that you will make all things right if I surrender to your will. So that I may be reasonably happy in this life and supremely happy with you forever in the next. Amen. The second prayer is again a familiar one. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace where there is hatred let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. Where there is sadness, joy. O oh, divine master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console. To be understood as to understand. To be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. Amen. And that, of course, is the prayer of St. Francis of Assisi. St. Francis, Reinhold Niebuhr, St. Paul, the author of the letter to the Romans, the prophet Isaiah, Jesus the Christ, they all understood that we are works in progress, and to know better means that we ought to be doing better. And by doing so, we can and will be born again into the kingdom of heaven more and more every day, here and now, in anticipation of the fullness of the kingdom to come. Let's pray. Author and perfecter of all those who seek the truth and the fullness of you. We come before you this morning and we acknowledge that sometimes we get stuck in our ways. We don't allow you to stretch us beyond the confines of our comfort zones. But we do want salvation. We do want forgiveness. We do want to be in right relationship with you and the rest of your children. So if we need to today, God, Light a fire, a fresh one underneath us that we would become God chasers once again. Help us to be born again. Allow us to admit our failings and embrace your forgiveness. Oh, dearest Lord, we know that it is not your desire that any should perish, but that through Christ Jesus all might be saved, not least of which ourselves. Forgive us and help us come to eternal life through him. Amen. Honoring our passage from Isaiah in particular, let's respond to our Bible readings and our message today with our hymn of response, which is an insert.
Amen. Please be seated. As we answer God's call together to the best of our ability, one of the ways that we do that is by lifting up one another's lives and prayer concerns. So with that, I draw your attention to the back of the messenger insert, and there you will see our updated and ongoing joys and concerns list as of printing time on Friday. Um, I do have one update for you, and then I'll turn things over to the floor. Uh, Diane Wilson has made it uh, to Woodlawn, and she is now engaged uh, in therapy, rehab, um, making slow but steady progress. So we praise God for that. Uh, it, was, it was dicey for a minute while she was still at the Cleveland Clinic. Um, are there any other joys or concerns for the good of the church family at this time? Okay, seeing none at the moment, I remind you that there are prayer cards in the pew racks, uh, and if you're joining us online, you can reach out to me through all of my contacts, uh, which are available all over the place on the interwebs. With that, uh, we know that the fullness of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, our, our perfect parent, protector, provider, uh, the, the brother who walks alongside of us, and the power which sustains us, uh, moves in our midst when we come together in the name of Jesus. Uh, so with that, let's formalize our prayer and confidence. Holy One, you call us into relationship with one another, that we might be called sisters and brothers, not only of the Most High Messiah, but of one another. You ask us to be transformed by the continuing revelation of who you are and what you care about. So help us to put aside anything that hurts or harms ourselves or others. Bless us to grow in strength and faithfulness to you and the ways that you want us to operate in this world. With that in mind, we lift up with a hearty concern our friends and loved ones who are struggling at this time. Whether it is chronic physical ailments, acute medical conditions, financial challenges, psychological struggles, what have you. We ask that you would move in power to heal and restore our friends and this hurting, broken world. And Lord, when we have examples such as we honor in this nation on weekends like this, when we have examples of other human beings being prepared to pay the ultimate price for the welfare of others, may we remember how much they teach us about Jesus and the way he lived his life and calls us to live ours. And let us not get bogged down by the burdens of this fallen world, but let us also rejoice in the goodness, the signs of new life that are all around us. Oh, Holy One, we want to enjoy the inheritance that you have assured for us through your Son and the seal, the power of the Holy Spirit coursing through us. With that in mind, we now cling to the promise of the Bible that when we don't know what or how to pray, the Spirit intercedes on our behalf with sighs and groanings too deep for human words. Receive then now, we humbly ask, our personal, our private, our silent prayers and petitions. Abba God, throughout even just our own Bible, you've been made known by many names and you've revealed yourself through distinct manners. Help us to see the fullness of who you are and to walk in the completion of your will and way based on the life, the sacrifice, 
the teachings, the resurrection power of the one who goes before us. With that in mind, we renew our commitment to Christ Jesus, praying the prayer that he taught his own disciples, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen and amen. As God's Spirit continues to be poured out upon us as we are born again over and over again, let us continue to find ways to walk in the truth of Jesus the Christ more and more fully. We do that to the best of our ability, bringing forth our time, our talents, and our treasures. Let's consider our tithes and offerings as we enjoy the gift of music once more during our offertory.
your attention to our prayer of dedication, which, now that you know better, we can all do better, myself included. It's a typo in your bulletin. It's actually based on Romans 8, 12 through 17. Sisters and brothers, in awareness of all God has done for us, we realize that it is our duty to give from our spirits and not just our flesh, our earthly nature. So we pray that what we share will contribute to the purposes of the spirit, to the way of love. Let our offerings combat fear. Bless what we bring to tell people that they can reject slavery and come to know they are able to be brought back into right relationship with you, to once again be called your children, adopted back into your embrace. In turn, we will we'll come, come to know that we share, share with Christ's inheritance from you. Even in our sufferings, sufferings we will trust that our ties and sacrifices will glorify Christ, and we will be glorified alongside of him. Amen. Amen. Loved ones, as we get ready to head out into our daily lives, let us remember that every day is an opportunity, a fresh start to be more like Christ tomorrow than we are today. And let us remember the sacrifices of all those who have given of themselves and of even their lives that we might enjoy the fullness of the freedom that God prepared in advance for us. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you and make the divine face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you, granting you everlasting peace. Go in that peace, loving and serving the Lord and one another. Amen. Amen.